All right, today I want to talk to you about a book that I read, found years ago, and actually gave presentations on it for a while. It's called The Fourth Turning by William Strauss and Neil Howe. The, the essence of this book, there's a few arguments that Strauss and Howe want to make. The first argument that they want to make is that history is linear in the sense that we don't repeat any exact event that's happened in the past, but that by and large history is very cyclical. And um, there are different worldviews that believe in different models of history, and the current worldview that children are taught, the secular worldview that children are taught in school, is that history is very linear. And um, while it has value to watch, uh, especially like in sciences and art, you can watch things um, developing, and, and of course over the last 500 years, you can see science um, and math building on itself and technology advancing and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's kind of a cool picture of history to look at those advances. On the other hand, when you ignore or throw out the idea of any cycles in history, then often you lose out on the opportunity to learn from history. One of the things that's valuable about studying history, and we talk about this in the video training on studying history, and that is one of the most important things you want to look for when you study history is cycles. What has happened before that might be repeated again? Uh, what, have people have ex what have people experienced? We think, I think so often, that because we fly in airplanes and we drive cars, that we're really, really different than past civilizations. And we are in, this, in the way that we live and in the, in the amount of knowledge that we have. And definitely, you can look at mankind, and the average man obviously knows more information than men knew a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. On the other hand, is he any better off for it? Is he genuinely more happy? Does he do more good in the world? Does he feel more self-fulfillment? Does he do good things with the knowledge that he has? And those are really important questions to ask that, that with a cyclical view of history, um, some of those things become even more important. What has happened to past civilizations that we can learn from? So Strauss and Howe want to make the argument that not only is history cyclical, but it has a four-part history that rotates every century. They make an argument that dates back several centuries in Western history, especially English history, and they show you, here's the four types of um, generations, the four generations, and every four generations there's this turning. And they go back and they cite actual events, and they have all these charts and, and all, this, all this historical knowledge. I mean, these guys are so well-researched. They know their history and they, uh, they understand this information backwards and forwards and they can apply it to all kinds of things. This is temperaments and archetypes, um, this, the seasons of life, and the whole first part of this, even if you never get all the way through this, you really ought to read through the seasons of life section. Um, maybe even not that whole chapter, but as they make their argument for cyclical time, it's very compelling and very valuable. Um, so they have all these charts in the middle, and they go through, here's a turning, here's, um, okay, so this one in particular is Mary England from 1594 to 1704. So this is just almost exactly 100 years, and it shows you the four turnings, it shows you the four phases. Here's the generations, the Puritan generation, and then this generation, this generation, and it fits the four types of, um, they have four types of generations that cycle. And this hundred year cycle happens over and over and over again, and it leads up to a crisis and then it resolves after the crisis, and that's kind of how um, history works. And so they go through this whole center section is the next hundred years, and the next hundred years, and the next hundred years, and it's really compelling the information that they've pulled together to really try to make this argument. Um, so let me read a couple things for you uh, from them. The first chapter is called Winter Comes Again, and um, it's talking about the value of looking at history cyclically and using that information to prepare properly for things that will happen in the future and to know those, that those things will happen. Um, it says, we cannot stop the seasons of history, but we can prepare for them. Uh, later on, they're talking about, um, they apply, they apply this, this model to all kinds of uh, historical examples. 
One example later in the Seasons of Life they give is the exodus from, uh, of the um, Hebrew people from Egyptian slavery. And it goes through um, the holy peers of Moses, the worshippers of the golden calf, the dutiful soldier peers of, of Joshua, the original generation of judges. And so it goes through that hundred year cycle and shows you this keeps happening, keeps happening, keeps happening, keeps happening. So you have um, an artistic generation, a prophet, a prof, uh, prophet generation, a nomad generation, and a hero generation. That's not the correct order. I can't remember exactly the order right now. I think it's the hero and then the nomad and then the prophet comes before and the artist is first. Anyway, so that's how those go um, in, in order. And those generations cycle over and over again. And it says about, they predict that about, that their, their argument is that about 70% of any given generation has those kinds of things in common. And this is a really cool thing when you get to the back. This is a book that you might not want to read the whole thing. And I don't think I've still read every word in this book. And I understand it. I've skimmed it several times in the center section. And um, especially the beginning and endings. And then those charts in the center where it shows the past um, centuries and turnings is very valuable. And in the back it says how America should prepare. And it's got some points um, of how we should prepare for a coming crisis. This was published in the 90s. And uh, I'll get to that in just a minute, but, but they're saying prepare values. It says, America's culture warriors need not worry whether values return to public life. They always do in a fourth turning with a vengeance. And, um, and so their, their argument is that those values will return. Prepare institutions. Don't try to build anything big. Uh, prepare politics. Prepare society. Prepare youth. Teach children as the nation... Treat children as the nation's highest priority, but don't do their work for them. And prepare the elders, prepare the economy, prepare the defense. And they have a little paragraph on each of those about how we can prepare. And it is one of those books that um, people sometimes read and get scared. But here's the cool thing about this. They don't necessarily mean that the world's going to come to an end tomorrow when they talk about these cycles. Here's what they said in the 90s about... Um, the next 20 years. And so, so they've done all this, I mean, I don't even know how many years of research, and they've pulled together this cycle to prove it historically over and over and over again every century, and they put this whole book together, and in tune with what it is that they've taught and said, they make a prophecy about, okay, now if this information is true, and it's interesting because they were publishing it right before they were saying the big crisis will come that we need to be watching out for. So here's what they said. Um, history is seasonal and winter is coming. Uh, fourth turning can be long and difficult, brief but severe, or perhaps mild. But the next fourth turning is due to begin shortly after the new millennium, midway through the next decade, around the year 2005. And we've got, right after this was written, with, within 10 years, 9-11 happened, and we did go to a new war, and it says, around the year 2005, a sudden spark will catalyze a crisis mood. Political and economic trust will implode. And um, it, they even go on to say the very survival of the nation will fill the very survival of the nation will fill at stake. And that is definitely how we felt. We felt like, oh my, oh man, we're being attacked. Our towers just went down. What does this mean? Are we going to have soldiers marching on our nation? And we took a lot of measures politically to try to ensure our, um, our safety. And we went into just all kinds of ridiculous debt, trying to fund measures to rescue airlines and all this kind of thing. It really was a major crisis and changed the mood of America into one of, of saving and caution. Overall, that's kind of still the mood of the nation. And then they go on to talk about what the, uh, by the 2020s, America could become a society that is good by today's standard and also one that works. Um, and so they, you know, obviously they couldn't see into the future, but they're taking the information that they've gleaned from their studies and giving it shape and making some very compelling arguments about what all this will mean to the future. And, and one of the ways that I've seen this book used a lot is with youth. Um, talking about the nomad generation that raises the hero generation and parents them well and prepares them for, 
for disaster and that kind of thing. And a lot of people, especially in, you know, if you get into really in educational circles, if you get into uh, homeschool, private school circles, parents feel much more responsibility for their education than I felt they felt when I was young. Uh, that movement is growing and growing and growing. It's really kind of a fascinating connection to make. And um, it's also, it has been used a lot with youth. In fact, they wrote one for youth. I can't remember what it's called. It's something about the hero generation, maybe. And it seems like it's almost a workbook where you fill things in, and they interviewed all these youth, and they said, yes, that's how we feel, and yes, that's what we're about. And um, that's really interesting, too. And, and kind of, I think, for, for leaders, for teachers, for parents, the emphasis there was to inspire. To inspire these youth to be serious about what was coming, to emphasize that, that the good times weren't always going to last, and that preparation was critical for them, and that they would be the ones that would bear the burdens of what would happen in these crises. So, that is the fourth turning. I highly, highly recommend it. It's good as, I mean, it's a kind of a cool overview of history. If you just got it, and you went to the center section, and you just read those pages of Cycle, you'd have a fantastic little Western history review. It's a compelling argument for the cycles of history. It's fascinating to look at different generations as having different attitudes and different roles to play as, as, as history marches forward. And also to think about what preparation might be necessary and to inspire youth to, um, to get the education that they need and the preparation they need to be the leaders of the next generation. So, I hope you enjoy it. For turning Strauss, William Strauss, and Neil Howe. See you next time.